think all cities in the world are today facing not only the pandemic, but also the climate crisis. Getting our small businesses back on track. Getting everybody vaccinated in an equitable manner. Fiscal stability and economic transformation. Urban planning and housing. Reduce gun violence. Safely reopening. Tackle congestion and clean up the air. Policing reform and confronting and correcting systemic racism. Interaction between community and police. The safety of our residents. And to increase employment, especially for women and for youth. Greenhouse gas emissions. Open our communities back up. Mental health and behavioral health challenges all at the same time. I think the most important innovation in the last year is cultural transformation housing fund that we set up that in two weeks collected 3.5 million dollars to help keep people housed. The aerospace company has pivoted to provide low-cost innovative new kind of ventilator for our health system. The innovations that have inspired me are the outdoor dining, our community health ambassadors, electrical mobility, contact tracing. One of my favorite innovations was a low-income transit pass sustainability and digitalization. And thanks to our community-based, data-driven response, we're now in the position to seize this recovery and make our city even more inclusive and successful than we were before. So we are creating better infrastructure for walking, for using bikes. Committing to closing the digital divide for good. Bold and impactful climate action plans. To a free universal college education. In one word, what is my outlook for our city in 2021? Resilient. Right. Hopeful. Is opportunity. Opportunity to have a new and transformed future. Is optimism. Creative. Resilient. To thrive. In Madrid, we find hope. 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 Hopeful. Hope. The resiliency and metal that's at the core of who we are. What gives me hope is everyday people in this city doing everything they can to help their neighbors. The fact that we've been able to come together during 2020, during all these crises, to build a resilient community fills me with hope. What gives me hope is that on all the challenges we face, mayors and cities are gonna lead the way. Hello, everyone. I'm Dan Porterfield, President and CEO of the Aspen Institute, and it's my great honor to welcome you to day two of City Lab. The Institute is so proud to bring you, in its eighth year running, this extraordinary convening with our partner, Bloomberg Philanthropies. I'd like to thank the Bloomberg Philanthropies team, including Jim Anderson, Patty Harris, and of course, Mayor Bloomberg himself, for their partnership and leadership. It was exciting to hear from Vice President Kamala Harris yesterday, and I know we all look forward to hearing from Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg, at the end of today's program. These are two remarkable leaders, and I note with some pride, both are longtime Rodell Fellows with the Aston Institute, recognized for their leadership in state and local government, something they share with so many others on our virtual stages during this event. And this year, like so many things, City Lab is different, and the conversations we are having could not be more urgent. Our sense of normalcy has been completely stripped away, and the deeper realities of injustice and inequity have been laid bare. We know now that we will need far greater resiliency and far more effective public health responses in order to deal with the inevitable future pandemics and climate crises that await us. But we must remember that while cities have been laid low before, they have always emerged stronger. Indeed, cities themselves hold the answers to their own reconstruction in the ideas and passions of their people and their leaders, from mayors and city councils to neighborhood organizations, churches and schools. There is always a wellspring of talent to turn ideas into action that makes a difference. The Aspen Institute was founded seven decades ago, as the world was still reeling from the tragedies of the Holocaust and World War II. The leaders who came together then 
shared a deep regard for human dignity and a sense of humanistic optimism that people of goodwill can create a more free, just, and equitable world. Now, we have to come together in another moment of hope, a time in which we realize that our core human capacities for love, reason, collaboration, empathy, and invention will be enormous assets for solving the very real problems that we face. And we look to cities, which still sit at the center of it all, to show us the way forward. Thank you for your leadership at this time of great need around the world. And thank you so much for joining us this week. And now, to continue to guide us on our world tour of cities, I'd like to turn it over to City Lab 2021 MC from New York City's Inside City Hall, Errol Lewis. Thank you, Dan. And hello, everybody. Welcome to day two of City Lab, the world's leading global summit for mayors and city innovators. We're coming to you live from New York City. I'm your City Lab host, Errol Lewis. Now, in case you missed it, yesterday, City Lab welcomed some of the biggest names and the brightest lights in urban innovation from all around the world. We heard from leading mayors and big thinkers. And for the first time ever at City Lab, we welcomed a vice president of the United States, Kamala Harris. Today, we will welcome even more special guests as we travel the globe and visit some of the world's most dynamic and creative and inspiring cities. Once again, before we really get going, let me share a few tips for your best viewing experience. Closed captions are available for all viewers. If you'd like to do that, you should hover over the bottom of this video and click CC and select display captions. Next up, you should know that City Lab is not just any old web meeting. We have designed City Lab 2021 to be as interactive and collaborative as possible, even on a small screen. So on the right side of your screen, you'll see the official City Lab chat, and I'll be continually reading your reactions and your comments. We invite you to use the chat to communicate with me and everyone else in this global audience. Be sure to tell us where you are tuning in from. I am glad to report that yesterday, viewers from 40 countries joined us here at City Lab, which is fantastic. Let's take a look. Who do we have so far? We have Ana from Medellin, Gabriela from Mexico City, Christina is joining us from Stockholm, and many more. During our panel discussions, you're going to see thought-provoking poll questions pop up. That's going to happen on the lower left side of your screen. It's not quite scientific polling, but we do want you to answer those questions. We'd like to know what you are thinking about the big issues that cities are tackling. And remember, one advantage of this online-only City Lab is the opportunity to venture out, at least virtually, to four amazing host cities on four different continents. We're including Bogota, Freetown, Helsinki, and San Francisco. In fact, let's head to San Francisco right now. Welcome City Lab to San Francisco. San Francisco is one of the most beautiful cities in the world. The people of San Francisco are creative, are fun, are absolutely incredible. Our diversity is our strength and our willingness to be open and accepting is why so many people have chose San Francisco to come as a sanctuary. The new public health order that we're announcing will require San Franciscans to remain at home with exceptions only for essential outings. It was definitely hard to stick my neck out there and be first at shutting a major city like San Francisco down, but it was necessary. So many people told me not to do it. Our economy was suffering. People were not visiting San Francisco. I grew up in a tough neighborhood and I think it prepared me to be as bold as I possibly could. You can't hesitate when you have information that is important to public health. You can't hesitate in not only providing that information to the public, but also making the right decisions that impact their lives. 
Laguna Honda Hospital in San Francisco, it's really an incredible success story. It's one of the largest assisted living facilities in the country. We knew the possibility of an outbreak in congregate living settings, especially amongst our elderly. We requested assistance from the federal government. We started working with the Department of Public Health. There were recommendations by the CDC. We followed the science and we acted quickly. Within the first two weeks that we uh, had the vaccine here in San Francisco, uh, we worked to get every patient and every employee vaccinated in Laguna Honda. As we look towards the next year, my hope is we'll treat one another better, we'll have a little bit more patience, and it'll be a brighter future because of our sacrifice. It has been challenging to be away from people, and now we're gonna be around one another, and as our economy recovers and as we get back on our feet, it's just gonna be a lot better for all of us. An inspiring video. From the start of this crisis, Maya Breed has led with courage and rigor. Leaders like her don't only save lives, they build trust in government which is critical to the public's health. As we've seen over the past year, trust in institutions is at an all-time low. There's distrust of science, distrust of data, distrust of masks. This is a crisis of credibility, a crisis we're going to have to overcome, not only to get to the other side of this pandemic, but to stop the next one before it starts. How exactly we rebuild that trust is a topic of our next distinguished panel. Our panelists include Dr. Vivek Murthy, who will soon have the unenviable task of serving a third president as our Surgeon General, Newark Mayor Ross Baraka, and Dr. Kelly Henning, who has long led the health program at Bloomberg Philanthropies. Moderating what is sure to be a fascinating conversation is Economic Security Project Senior Fellow, Mia Birdsong. In the United States, where public trust in institutions has fallen to all-time lows, the pandemic has hit harder than anywhere else. Now, as the COVID-19 crisis extends into a second year, what barriers does that distrust pose to mitigations and recovery efforts, starting with the largest vaccination push in U.S. history? So my first question is, where does trust already exist and how do we leverage it? Dr. Murthy, let's start with you. Well, thank you so much, Mia. You know, trust is such an important issue because in in a public health crisis, whether it's a pandemic or any other sort of challenge, the most important resource you have is public trust. Without it, you really can't achieve the objectives you need, whether that's public education efforts, whether that's getting people to take a vaccine or take other measures to protect themselves. But trust still does exist in communities. The challenge is that not everyone necessarily trusts the same people. And trust is also situation dependent. You may trust your cab driver, for example, to get you to the airport, but maybe not necessarily to, to water your plants and watch over your house when you're away. Uh, so many people though have someone or some group that they trust in their lives. It may be their family and friends, their faith community, maybe their doctor, it may be their local elected leaders. And engaging these messengers is really important to getting messages across, whether it's about vaccines or other health matters. And that requires true partnership bilateral partnership, two-way partnership. And ideally, you build those partnerships before a crisis arrives so that they're there uh, and ready to use and lean on and rely on uh, during a public health emergency. Mayor Baraka, can you expand a bit on how all levels of government might better partner with community organizations to build better long-term relationships and trust? Well, I think those uh, relationships begin before the crisis. And I think a lot of folks scramble at the last minute to try to uh, put these organizations together, put these groupings together, start to collaborate. And, and it's difficult to build trust even in the middle of a pandemic or a crisis. Uh, you know, people still don't know how to work together. I mean, don't know the inner workings of organizations, don't know who to contact, who who's in charge of what, how to navigate that. Uh, and so it's always important to build uh, trust with organizations early on to have a regular practice of meeting with community organizations, talking to people, having an open door policy, uh, making sure even if you disagree, 
that people know you're transparent and what you're disagreeing about. Uh, and so those relationships have to be built over over time. Uh, it's a mistake to think that you can do that in the middle of a, of a crisis. So that really leaves us in a challenging position, right? Those relationships haven't been built, but if we're going to get the public to get vaccinated and to do the other things that are necessary to get COVID under control, are there things that government can do right now to quickly build some of those bridges and repair some of the damage that's been done because of lack of trust? Well, I think that ultimately, um, you need, we need to be talking to the community as much as we possibly can. Uh, having full transparent discussions and not really trying to push things on people. I think the the kind of uh, practice of trying to tell people, oh, you have to take this, uh, you, you must do it, uh, you know, or, or else is wrong. I think first acknowledging the fact that the relationship has been broken for some time and that it needs to be repaired. Uh, a two, being really honest about giving people the facts and information about what is and what was and what's involved and allowing people to come uh, to these conclusions at their own pace. And I know it's a sense of urgency, uh, uh, but we laid, we made this bed, right? So there, there's an urgency to get people to get vaccinated. And I understand that I have the same urgency. But we also have to take into consideration history uh, and, and broken relationships. Uh, and you can't rush that. You have to allow people the opportunity to become comfortable with what's happening on their own, which means that you may have to have more conversations than you initially plan to have. You may have to have, uh, you know, multiple conversations over and over and over again with people uh, uh, to be able to get them to be comfortable with trusting the organizations, the system. And some of it is not historical trust. Some of the trust is is trust that doesn't exist now because of problems that exist today. For sure. And one of the things that you just brought up, Mayor Baraka, that I want to ask you about, Dr. Murthy, is about how information and facts are shared. One of the most effective tools we have in fighting COVID is masks. In the beginning of the pandemic, we saw both missteps when it came to communication about mask wearing and the politicization of mask wearing. So if you could go back and redo it, what would you do differently that we missed the first time? Well, Mia, it's a great, a great example. And, and unfortunately, the history of public health is uh, full of examples of interventions that science says work, but which we haven't been able to do as effective a job, you know, at getting out into the community and getting people to adopt. And that's not necessarily people's fault. You know, it says Mayor Baraka was saying it can be the result of longstanding challenged relationships and distrust that has built up over years that we may not have acknowledged. But I think that the idea that you, the way you want to address this initially is you want to, number one, start with listening and understanding people's concerns because they're not all the same. And one of the, I think, potential pitfalls we uh, we run into is assuming that everyone has the same concerns. The second thing is we want to acknowledge what their concerns are and validate them. See, too often, I think public health makes people feel judged, uh, judged if they're not doing exactly what we say uh, that, you know, that they need to do without acknowledging what their concerns are. And I think the third thing we have to do is work on getting people to yes on the things they want to do instead of always saying no. I mean, I was aware when I served as Surgeon General before that people sometimes uh, would assume that I was going to be the one telling them everything they couldn't do. Like, don't eat that piece of pie. Uh, don't eat that dessert you really like. Don't have that other drink. Whereas I think what we have to do with public health is more frame it as a set of tools that can, can help get people to where they want to be, whether it's getting together with friends. Can masks allow you to do that more safely? Well, yes, if you can get if get together with people, distance and masks in outdoor settings, that is dramatically lower risk. And a mask can be a way then uh, to form a bridge, essentially a social connection. Uh, it's always important to have messages that are informed by science and not by politics. It's been a challenge uh, in the past. And you've got to ensure that you've got a diversity of messengers because the message matters, but sometimes a messenger uh, matters even more. And that's why these community partnerships are absolutely essential to good public health work. Much of your work over the past couple of years have, has looked at um, loneliness and the public health consequences of weakened social connection. And in my own work, I've seen that loneliness is in many ways an outgrowth of some very American ideals around individualism and an understanding of freedom that kind of rejects interdependence and connection. How should we be thinking about combating toxic individualism in the context of a public health crisis like COVID? Hmm. 
Well, Mia, it's a, it's a really interesting question. And I know you've done such, uh, such important work in this space. Uh, I think there is a thread of individualism that runs through America, the American experience, but there's also a strong thread around community. And it's interesting because it's not that relationships aren't important to many of us, uh, but, but for many of us, including me, relationships have just drifted lower on our lived priority list, not on our stated priority list. We'll always say that our relationships to our family is the most important and our close friends, but in how we live our life, where we put our time, attention, and energy, for many of us, again, myself included, uh, work often has crept into first place just based on time, energy, and effort. But on a societal level, I think what we've also done is we've allowed the balance between the individual and the collective uh, to swing away from community. Uh, perhaps too much. And I think what that's meant is that we cherish individual accomplishment and effort. Uh, we tell stories about the individual entrepreneur who built an extraordinary company or the most important athlete uh, on, a, on a football team or basketball team. But we often don't sufficiently recognize and lift up the extraordinary progress that's made possible by collective effort. And I think we change this through the stories that we tell, uh, the efforts that we reward, and through the lives that we choose to live. Uh, and I think that the life that I feel called to live and that I feel as a society we need to move toward is one where we truly do prioritize people and relationships, where we put people first. Um, but we've got to get there one by one uh, by living that uh, in our own lives and ultimately by telling those stories in our media, uh, in our speeches, uh, in our communities. Uh, because the stories we tell are essentially communicating what we value and we've got to communicate that the collective, that the community truly does matter, especially in moments like this. Dr. Henning, I want to get you into this conversation. Um, I think that many would argue that in addition to flawed and confusing messaging and some of the challenges of um, American culture in particular, we also just don't have robust public health infrastructure, and that goes beyond our ability to respond to infectious disease. What are the broader public health investments that we need to make in order to, to better position us to fight future crises and to prevent them from happening in the first place? Mia, thanks for that question. You know, we've been working um, on some of these issues for a long time, long before the pandemic actually hit. and. When people think about public health, they often think of um, historical pieces like smallpox eradication or polio, or um, perhaps more recently, Ebola virus uh, outbreaks that have occurred. And now, of course, COVID-19. But actually, there are many other issues that are very front and center to public health. And they include things like all of the chronic diseases that are so uh, amplifying this current pandemic. So things like high blood pressure, and the control of high blood pressure, obesity and overweight, physical activity, um, and, the, and the lack of physical activity, diabetes, cancer, heart disease. These are all public health issues. And these are all things that many of the very same communities that are most impacted right now by COVID-19 are also very highly impacted by. And this issue of trust really uh, extends to these chronic diseases. Folks are not being met where they are. They're not being encouraged uh, to seek care. They're not, they're not being supported in many of the ways that we need them to be in order to address these really enormous killers. Um, smoking is another one. Smoking is a, um, uh, tobacco use is a, a major killer still in the United States. And um, these are all public health issues that have uh, equity issues attached to them and that we really have this opportune moment right now to address in this COVID pandemic. So the question is, how do we actually build the infrastructure we need to address not just infectious diseases, but all the other kinds of public health issues we have? And is part of that about actually expanding how we understand the role of public health? Yeah, I think there's a lot of work that could be done to bring the public along in terms of their understanding about what public health is. But I also think public health has a lot of listening to do. I mean, what are these obstacles to doing, um, to providing better services and to engaging the communities that are most affected? Uh, we have lots of answers in public health, but we don't have lots of listening all the time. And I think this might be the moment when we really want to double down on uh, engagement with those communities. We've got the attention of the public, um, of the 
policymakers in this COVID moment, now we have an opportunity to even go even further and really address some of the underlying health issues that are so um, seriously impacting uh, vulnerable communities. So, Mayor Baraka, let's get real. The vulnerable communities that we are talking about are communities of color, low-income folks, disabled folks, and there are historic and present-day reasons for all of these communities to legitimately distrust our healthcare systems. So I have a two-part question for you. The first part is, what should be happening right now to make sure that people who have been marginalized and exploited are not left behind when it comes to vaccines? And secondly, what are some of the things that our healthcare systems need to do, not just to build relationships moving forward, but to repair relationships with Black folks, Indigenous folks, and other communities who've experienced harm from those systems? I mean, look, look, places like Newark, I mean, African-American women are four times more likely to die giving birth than anybody else in the state. And we have one of the highest infant mortality rates in the country, right? So that also contributes to the mistrust of people taking care of us. I think the first thing is access. So it's not enough just to, to talk about what's going on and, and, and we, we, we have to have access. So access to health systems, to, to wellness. So we have to make sure that the vaccine is available to people in the community, that we're not just setting up these big sites. 50% of the people in Newark don't even drive, right? So when they first started these drive-in testing sites, you wiped out half of my city. So we had to figure out how to do walk-ups and do pop-ups in various communities and neighborhoods and, and church parking lots and the parking lots of stores and parking lots of schools. Uh, and so the same thing in terms of the vaccine, uh, those things have to happen. We have to make it accessible uh, and put people involved in the processes who come from those communities that people trust. You have to bring those people involved in the processes uh, inside as, as nurses, as administrators, as practitioners. They have to be involved as credible messengers, right? All of those folks have, uh, you get the, uh, you, the, the religious community involved uh, as well. Uh, as we started to do in Newark, you start vaccin getting them vaccinated, allowing them to be credible messengers. Uh, you know, those things have to happen. And I think with the public health infrastructure period, uh, we have to get away from this um, kind of emergency room model and go towards the kind of public health clinics in our community because we don't have access to primary care physicians. So I listen to the CNN and they always say, talk to your doctor, ask your doctor this. Well, the doctor in our community is the emergency room. So there's no primary care physicians. And so we have to set up clinics and opportunities uh, uh, in these neighborhoods in order to get people acclimated and give them access to right healthcare. And last thing I'm sorry I want to say is that healthcare in our community is crisis oriented. People go to the doctor when they are about to kill over, pass away, super sick, falling down. And there's not a, a, a kind of emphasis on wellness. And I think that all of those other issues, the high blood pressure, the other kind of things that li led to the comorbidities, uh, this whole idea about wellness has to be taken seriously in our communities to get people to trust that you're trying to keep them alive or help, let them have a, a great life, not just you know care for them while they die. I really appreciate all of that. Part of what I hear you all saying is that public health actually needs to be for the public, but it also needs to be of the public, right? It's not just that we have a group of people over here who are our health care practitioners and experts and that they get to decide what a community's priorities should be and then go apply their methodologies and practices to that community, but that we need a more integrated approach that is responding to a community's self-identified needs and that the people from a community need to be part of the health structure that is serving that community. I think another thread I want to lift up is that we're not just talking about one-on-one -on -one relationships, like the kind we might have as individuals with our doctors, but public health is also about collective relationships. This is where I, we think about things not just like heart disease or smoking, but also things like access to high quality housing and food. Those are all the things that we really need to support our wellness. Thank you so much to all of my guests. Next up, we are taking you to Freetown, Sierra Leone, where you'll hear from the fashion designer, 
Marianne Kai Kai about the work she's doing to address COVID and build a new generation of leaders. You can find the most resilient, hardworking, positive people in this city. We've been through so much, but that's a Freetown spirit. When we had the first cases of COVID-19 as a fashion brand, myself and a group of Mademoki friends, the Antonio Rudiger Foundation, European Union in Sierra Leone, Launchbox Gift, as well as Mercury International, came on board to produce 80,000 face masks. And so myself, the mayor of Freetown and her team of people, we went to all the markets, explaining to them how to wear the mask. We're training them in tailoring, makeup application, photography, and basket weaving. It was very important to set up a mentoring program that was focused on empowering the next set of girls that are coming up. I want in the next five to 10 years to see some of these women taking on the mantle of leadership because that's the only way that Sierra Leone is going to grow to the next level when we empower women. That was great. I know a lot of you want to visit Freetown. I think I need to get over there soon myself. City Lab is always a showcase for city creativity. Coming up soon, Kate Levin of Bloomberg Associates is going to lead a conversation on how cities can bring back their creative industries and power a sustainable economic and civic recovery through arts and culture. But first, we're going to travel through cyberspace and explore how city governments can better protect public safety by safeguarding cities against cyber threats. Please also look out for the cybersecurity poll questions that will appear on the bottom left of your screen. Joining me now are Los Angeles Deputy Mayor Gene Holm, Greg Morissette from Cornell Tech, and somebody you might have seen in the news recently, the former head of cybersecurity for the Department of Homeland Security, Christopher Krebs. To lead this discussion, let's go to City Lab writer Linda Poon. So Chris, I like to start with you. Um, what are some of the greatest cybersecurity threats right now that cities are facing? And where are their greatest vulnerabilities? Hey, thanks for having me on. I, I think there are three primary threats that I'd be thinking about or, or really a mix of risk issues. First is we're seeing a lot of criminal actors look to disrupt functional services delivered to citizens. And, and we're primarily seeing that through ransomware. And, and again, that's locking systems up where you can't go pay your bills, your parking tickets, you know, process taxes. And, and that's ultimately disruptive at the local level. We're also seeing an increasing digital divide. And that's the, the technology that are fueling those citizen services, the gap between the haves and the have nots and the funding that's available to facilitate the digital transformation at the local level is really widening right now, particularly in the era of COVID. And then the last, it's not so much a digital, you know, ones and zeros threat, a cybersecurity threat, but we are seeing an erosion of confidence in government at the national and the local level, because frankly, local news reporting is starting to evaporate. And where do our citizens go to get information they can trust? And that trust in government is critical uh, at all levels so you can you know, improve investments, improve service delivery. If you don't have that trust in government, it's, it's really hard uh, to make the advances you need. Yeah, I really like that. So I see this as two sides. There is something about, um, you know, needing to protect the systems and infrastructure of cities and then needing to protect that trust between the city and, and the residents. So turning over to Greg, what does this mean in terms of how cities protect their system? You know, how do cities go about, um, you know, ensuring their employees know how to protect against cybersecurity threat, right? Because some of the most recent attacks, deceivingly simple methods, right? Phishing emails. So what is your take on that? So a little bit of education goes a long way in terms of training employees. Um, hiring a firm to come in and uh, probe for weaknesses and look for problems is another good best practice in a sense. Um, thinking about the software that you're installing and uh, how it's safely configured, uh, what dependencies it has. If you look at something like Solar Winds, the, the recent attack there, a lot of people didn't even realize they were running that in their networks. So 
understanding what you're running, making sure it's patched, uh, educating your users, basic digital hygiene, frankly. And I think there's a lot, a lot of need for public, uh, private public partnership. So when cities are actually, um, you know, working with the private sector on, on, on these security software, like what do they need to know? What do they need to know is what is essential versus something that's just, you know, all talk. Yeah, that's a great question because security firms like to scare people and, and sell them services, frankly. So you, you need somebody who can come in and understand the code that you're running, how it was developed, whether it was tested, if the company's following best practices and, and threat modeling, minimizing attack surfaces, this sort of thing, whether they're using the latest technologies in terms of static analysis or other tools that might secure the code, controlling the update process and so forth. So, you know, I, I think when you go to procure software these days, um, one of the things you want to do is go ask for the product security officer and, and talk to them and find out how, how the company's behaving, what their practices are and whether they're doing the best that they can. So Gene, I'd like to hear from you as someone who works with the city of Los Angeles, and I'd like to know how you guys prioritize cybersecurity. So, you know, we're a city government, and so we think of things in a very holistic way. And we know that security is everybody's concern, right? If anybody breaks on the security chain, then you're vulnerable. And so we have a lot of partnerships. We have the LA Cyber Lab, for example, that we've had for a while, that really looks at partnerships with our local small businesses. We know big businesses, you know, in the region probably have a, a cybersecurity team, even though, you know, there are still uh, ransomware and things that, that Chris talked about. But at the same time, we know the small businesses and 66% of our businesses are small and immigrant owned. We want to make sure that those folks also have the same uh, understanding and trust and ability to secure their systems, whether it's their square that they're using just for, you know, getting electronic payments. And so the cyber lab each month, uh, shares best practices and information on how to secure their systems. We work with a regional joint service across the whole region, um, making sure we're doing that with other governments and with the federal government. And then um, we have a particular focus on, on these partnerships with uh, three of our bigger departments, which is LAX Air Airport, the Port of Los Angeles, through which 40% of all goods to the U.S. come through, which is a pretty amazing fact. And we run the largest municipal uh, water and power in the country. And so our Department of Water and Power. So all of those are, are essential services that have to be kept secure. And so we work in a, in a tandem way of both uh, helping people secure those systems. And then kind of to what Greg was saying, we also do a lot of internal phishing. <laughs> and if you click on an email, then you'll get taken to the security course you have to retake. If I can jump in real quick, just on the last point, you know, Mayor, Mayor Garcetti really was a trailblazer in using federal resources to improve cybersecurity at the local level. He used federal grant dollars from FEMA to set up the city lab and the, and the cyber center in LA. And that, you know, those lessons learned should be spread far and wide across the country. And it, and it shows you that, that there are resources available. In fact, the Department of Homeland Security Secretary, Ali Mayorkas, just the other day said that they're going to start A, a really welcome change in the approach to that federal uh, local uh, partnership. Yeah, I do think funding is definitely a big part. Um, but Chris, I wanted to ask you, are there other things that the federal government can do in terms of partnering with cities? In terms of resources, there's also that human capital, that knowledge, right? Um, and a lot of these city systems are a bit outdated. Information is siloed. There's not much sharing. Is there anything that the federal government and the local governments can work together on? So I think there, there are probably three things. First, um, the, the recent National Defense Authorization Act, which is the one bill every year that Congress always passes, included a number of cyber provisions. And one of them uh, was a bill uh, that was called the Statewide Cyber Coordinator Act. And basically what it, it required was that CISA, my old agency and the federal government, would put a cyber advisor in at least one in every state. And that person's focus is to work with state and local governments to provide best practices and resources. So it's all about more expertise and knowledge transfer down with the local operators. I think the second thing is we need to help make 
training and education and awareness more accessible. There are federal programs, there's training programs, but there's also exercises that, that sometimes, you know, in the past, it's been about send your person to Idaho Falls in Idaho to go through industrial control system training. That's just not scalable. It's not accessible to everyone. So we need to take that training and deliver it to the endpoint, the people that use it. And then lastly, there are other federal programs like the .gov uh, top level domain. We've seen a lot of cities and localities not use that .gov and instead use a .com or a .us or .org org for their their domains because of it costs four hundred dollars a month and to me that's such a a tragic security decision to not move to a more secure uh website because of four hundred dollars a year and so usg the government the federal government is now able to carry some of that cost so i think every city out there every every county should move and uh, move to that dot gov uh, domain and then for greg i wonder from sort of an engineering perspective um it's helpful for cities to think of this as an engineering problem um the way you know if you see a problem with bridge you go and solve it you know what is your take on that i i wish that was the case we don't yet have a science of security and engineering around security that really makes makes it possible to to treat it like bridge building. But I think uh, in addition to the things that Chris was talking about, investments in security uh, research from the federal level are really important because we need new architectures and new approaches that mean you don't have to train everybody to, to be a security engineer. We need better practices in the way that we develop software. And, and agencies like uh, IARPA and DARPA uh, and so forth have have actually developed programs that are actually quite effective. They're just very costly right now. We need to transition those ideas out of the labs and into the real world. The other part that I'm interested in is protecting residents, protecting local businesses, especially with the pandemic. Every so much has moved online. There's so much data that's being gathered. So what are some best practice in terms of ensuring that that trust, right, between residents and government, ensuring that, you know, when residents put in their data, fill out the form that is being protected and that's not going to get stolen by cybersecurity threats. Well, I think it's really important to be transparent about what you're collecting and not um, obscure it. So, you know, we've all, how many times have we clicked on the terms and conditions when we download a new app and we just kind of like get through it because we're trying to get to whatever it is we're trying to do. Um, so we have actually, uh, we're just publishing a digital bill of rights, a code of ethics for development of systems that um, show what we collect for people, how we use that data. And, um, and part of that is a new contactless government executive directive for Mayor Garcetti that focuses on how we're helping people get access to these services and making sure that information known by one department isn't necessarily known by another. So that I may have a dog in the city of Los Angeles knows that because I have a license, but I don't necessarily need LAPD to know that. Um, and so I don't need the zoo to know what LAPD knows about me as well. And so the idea of starting to use things like blockchain, um, transparency. So when you sign into your Angelino account, which is our single sign on service across city services, you can see what data people, what data different departments have about you. you will be in the future be have the ability to correct that data if it's wrong. But just having that transparency, I think is so important and setting expectations. And then the other thing we've done, especially around this Angelino account, was we just finished up two months of listening sessions with our community-based organizations and individuals in, who are homeless, elderly, immigrants, foster care youth, that are really the ones who traditionally have had issues for, for lots of good reasons with trust in government. And so the idea is how do we architect and create things across the digital divide, as Chris said, across these trust issues to start to build trust up through transparency and access to services. Speaking of the digital divide, I know that's something that's been blown wide open because of the pandemic, especially with school, right? So many children have moved online and I have read of hacks that are targeted at schools. Should cities be preparing for more of these attacks and, and how should they do that? Oh, so yeah, I think I think it's important because we we have so many people who could potentially be vulnerable to those attacks, right? Including five year olds who are coming on through you know iPads or tablets to connect to to kindergarten classes. So you know, with the LA Unified School District, we have a very tightly controlled way for particularly younger kids to get access. We just are in the midst of distributing eighteen thousand free Wi Fi hotspots through a partnership with T Mobile to our homeless and foster and at risk youth. 
And those all have additional security on them just to make sure everybody's being safe and is not going to be vulnerable. Um, but then we also have to make sure that the teachers and staff and others are, are doing that in ways. So what you can do it through platforming and making sure everybody all goes into the same platform and securing that. But in reality, when you're really kind of learn in a learning environment, you have to kind of open things up a little bit. And so it just becomes part of what I, you know, I always think that we should be having computer science for all. We should have classes on computer science and cybersecurity. And in fact, we have a program that many par school districts participate in called the Cyber Patriots program that is starting in third grade, help to teach kids cybersecurity skills. And then by high school, they're in competitions with each other. It's super fun. Um, I like to take, um, I like to feel your thoughts, all of your thoughts about this idea of everything being interconnected nowadays, right? This, this race for a smart city. What is sort of your best advice as to, you know, how should each city should go about becoming smarter? So we have a new urban tech program here at Cornell Tech that is really focused on that. And one of the biggest challenges is uh, we're gonna be taking in tremendous amounts of data from, uh, you know, every automobile uh, on the road to, uh, all the bridges are going to be wired with sensors to buildings to hvac systems enormous amounts of data and doing something intelligent with that data uh you know using that to to tackle big issues like climate change or uh, uh other other things like this that um cities need need to, to get in front of is one of the biggest opportunities but also one of the biggest challenges that data is a big target for cyber criminals uh, big challenge. So we ha we have to really think through the security and privacy issues from the very beginning when we start to architect these smart cities of the future. Yeah, and I'd add on top of that, that cybersecurity and privacy protection, it's a team sport. And what we've seen, what I've seen in, in, in my career is that the leaders that embrace that mentality, that embrace a culture of cybersecurity are the ones that ultimately run successful organizations that can surf survive and thrive when you have a bad day. And, and again, this goes to Mayor Garcetti's leadership in this space. Um, you know, the more leaders we have that, that view cybersecurity as, as a everyday business risk um, tend to be, again, more successful. You know, cities have to take a special vigilance, as do other regional governments, on protecting their citizens' privacy and the privacy of their data. So we're doing a project with NASA right now that's amazing around air quality. So we're interconnecting all of our smart city Internet of Things sensors. We're doing citizen science. You can check out air quality sensors at libraries in our environmental justice neighborhoods. It's all great, but we're collecting data that doesn't reveal in information about the individual person, but it reveals information about the environment and combining the data from the ground with satellites to be able to better predict air quality uh, and the policies that we're using to impact that. I, I think architecting these programs from the beginning with the idea of privacy and security in mind is the only way that we're gonna really get to being a smart city that is also a safe city and a city that is trusted. All right, well, Chris, Jan and Greg, thank you so much for all your time. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much. Doing public art projects, it's a powerful way just to inspire the youth and even the, the older generations and to make them just feel more proud about their neighborhood. We've not only made the intersection safer, we've not only made it more beautiful, but we're doing the two together. It's one thing when artists do things for the community, but it's totally different when the community is actually invited to be involved. To have a grant of this size has allowed us the opportunity to do so much more than we could ever do without members' help. It really changes our future. The creative sector, including artists and arts organizations, has been particularly hard hit 
by the pandemic. There's been a precipitous drop in revenue and widespread unemployment that hasn't shown any signs of rebounding yet. So our conversation today is going to engage in two intertwined questions. What can cities do to help artists and cultural organizations get back on their feet? And what role can the arts play in civic and economic recovery from the multiple crises plaguing our cities? I'm Kate Levin, principal at Bloomberg Associates, a pro bono consulting firm that advises cities. And I'm joined by two major cultural leaders, Camila Forbes, executive producer of the fabled Apollo Theater in Harlem, and Hank Willis Thomas, one of the most important visual artists working today in the U.S. Um, I'd like to start our conversation with a question from the city's point of view. There may be increasing awareness of the value of arts and culture to cities, but the details are often a bit hazy for the leaders who have to make excruciating decisions these days. So my question to each of you, and I'm going to start with Camila, what advice would you give city leaders? Why should they take a risk, as it may seem to them, to invest in the arts? What can the sector do that is of special, urgent value right now? The arts have the power to keep people close. It reminds us of our empathy, and it reminds us of our humanity. Um, this past year has shown us how much we need all three of those things, um, being close, being empathetic, um, and, and also looking towards each other for our own humanity. I mean, I think the biggest challenge right now is that I'm, I'm very clear that this pandemic has been destructive of our health infrastructure. Um, and up until a couple months ago, I wasn't sure if we were gonna see our way back <laughs> from a particular, you know, having a very specific national health plan, which I'm very clear on now that we will have a national health plan to see our way out of this health pandemic. But what about the um, PTSD pandemic, right? What about the mental health pandemic? What about the transformational healing around our citizens within this country? That is where the arts and civic leadership need to work hand in hand to truly orchestrate the sense of healing, to truly help to teach us how to feel again. We literally have not been in physical spaces with one another, with citizens, with neighbors, with loved ones in over a year. This is really destructing sort of the core essence of who we are as humans. So, so that is, it is, it is, that's what I think is most important is how do we see artists as civic leaders to develop a civic plan with urban planets, planning and, and leadership um, to, to develop a path to healing. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad that we're, 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 we have not had a conversation before, we've never met before, but we're both thinking a lot about artists as civic leaders and the role of healing um, within our communities as uh, part of the, the responsibility and the, the lane which artists can serve. Um, I think civic leaders also could broaden them, their perspectives of their role to be seen as creative. You know, uh, urban planning is an art form of uh, writing laws is an art form. Uh, in, in many ways, uh, participating in civic life is the greatest creative collaboration uh, that there is, right? That because you, uh, some call it bureaucracy. <laughs> I think a lot, a lo another way of looking at it is uh, collaborative community making. And, and, um, and what we call art actually allows us to relate to a lot of things that we think we already know very differently. No artist makes work about right now or for right now. We we make things with anticipation that they will have an impact on the future. And so we're living in the future. And I believe that the investment in that future thinking is actually going to be fruitful um, for the country and for the world. So Camila, what would you advise a city leader to think about in terms of a narrative of recovery? What do you see pieces of that arc are as particularly, you know, given your extraordinary expertise as a theater artist? So as a city leader, it is about how can we vision possibility for tomorrow, right? Um, art is a democratizing tool. And guess what? So has this pandemic democratized us all uh, almost in a way of, a, of really equalizing a, a sense of playing field, if you will, to, to think anew, to restart anew. 
Um, so from a city leader point of view, I think it's about when we think about returning back to normal, understanding that we are visioning a new possibility of normal. This is an opportunity to truly rethink, refashion, reshape um, our cities, our neighborhoods, um, our towns, our cultural life in a, in a vastly new way. Um, so, you know, I think that's as artists, that's what we do every time we enter a new project. We almost, you know, we leave, we take with us what we learned from the last project, but it is about creating amongst a blank slate. Um, and and I think city leadership has to be that bold, um, take that kind of bold steps forward um, um, as, as artists do every single day. So what have you learned specifically at the Apollo from this closure period? So I've learned resiliency. Um, uh, we've learned that, you know, culture cannot be canceled. Um, you know, as much as our building has been closed, we've had to pivot um, to the digital space in order to connect with community. We've also learned that as an arts institution, it is not just art that we are connecting, but we had have to, we had had to fill in gaps where, um, where, where leadership had not, where we had provided information for food banks, information for, you know, places where people can get tested through our program Apollo Care. Um, art centers really serve as community conveners. And that's one thing I think in the last 10 months we've really been able to see is that so many, whether it's art centers, churches, other, you know, formal and informal gathering spaces, um, you know, had to fill in the gaps as, as, as really civic leaders within our communities. Hank, my, my version of that question for you, you have created so many contributions to the public realm through projects like Fort Freedom, uh, through the Truth Booth, through uh, the Unity Sculpture, um, for those of us in Brooklyn that get to see that, uh, through Rise Up um, in Montgomery, Alabama. So many cities are dealing with complexities around monuments, around memorials. How do you look at your work in terms of creating a conversation with your audiences? And, and how do you think civic leaders should try and understand what's in the public realm? I think m my role in, in the work that I do in the public realm is really inspired by the idea that there are people who aren't yet born that I and we have things to say to. And the objects we put in the public, the buildings we build, really are, are a message to them. And we want them to be thinking, looking backwards, but with an eye towards the future so that they don't make the mistakes that we have made in the past. And I think that does require critical thinking and having questions embedded in public space. Whereas uh, what I grew up with, most of us grew up with were statements about who was important and why because they were on a horse and on a pedestal <laughs> but not why they were important and who was not being included and so i i really feel that a uh, public art has a responsibility of opening minds and, and, and sparking curiosity so that we can look deeper into our past so that we can have a more fulfilling future so a lot of times city leaders are very comfortable with business sectors having an arc from incubation to profit center. Culture does that, but that's not always as evident. And Camila, I'm wondering if you can talk about your journey uh, with the ta Coates piece, Between the World and Me, because that certainly started in the nonprofit world and ended up on HBO. Can you give us a, a, a vision of what that's about? Sure. Um, so in 2000, obviously, ta -Nehisi Coates wrote a book in uh, 2015 that became a National Book Prize winner, Between the World and Me, um, really became a voice amongst the rising Black Lives Matter movement. Um, the book was was how to tell, write letters to his young 15-year-old son, what does it mean to be a Black man in America in the age, Black boy in America in the age of Trayvon Martin. 2018, I decided to trans translate that work for the stage um, and with the work of, you know, with the support of the Apollo theater in which commissioned and produced the work along with the Kennedy Center. So it was truly incubated within a nonprofit structure, within a nonprofit institution, um, within mission-based institution. Uh, the work then lived as a stage production in that toured New York.
social justice and around art and social justice was actually HBO. Um, so we shot it completely during the age of COVID. Um, but amidst that also, what was very important to us um, and making this film was to make sure that as we were entering the corporate sector, that the corporate sector was also able to support the nonprofit sector that supported this work. So um, HBO made um, an incredible gift um, of one million um, from Warner Media to Apollo Theater for their work amongst arts and social justice in the landscape of arts and social justice. Um, and so that, that to us was, a Again, a really interesting hybrid relationship between the nonprofit and for-profit world. Uh, the world, the work aired in November of 2020 um, and continues to live on the platform to today. So if you had to say one thing to your neighbors on 125th Street about the value of the Apollo, what would it be? We are home, just home. And Hank, one of the things you've talked about is how there's not enough room for ambiguity in cities. Do you still feel that way? And what do you think is the role of the arts in helping create, I guess, productive ambiguity? Well, I mean, there were a lot of terrible things that we experienced uh, over 2020 and into 2021. Uh, some of the most beautiful things I saw in New York City in 2020 were the creative ways that people gathered uh, safely to uh, share their voices. And one of the most exciting ones for me was on Juneteenth, uh, where there was like a impromptu uh, concert parade that stopped in front of the Apollo and uh, was just a celebration of, of, of joy and community. And uh, we took over the streets with uh, black joy, with civic joy. And um, that kind of experience reminded me of how just people willing to say yes to something new and something different in the spirit of positivity and community can open the minds of, of, of uh, uh, and fill voids. And that's what creativity is. It doesn't have to live on a canvas. It doesn't have to have something sanctioned. It, it just has to have a spirit that is undeniably good. And that's the, and so there's that kind of ambiguity. Um, uh, I think the late John Lewis would call um, good trouble. Yes. And, and, and that's essential to the fabric of any healthy city has been yes. be going forward. Well, thank you both so much, Hank and Camila. And now back to our City Lab host, Errol Lewis. That was brilliant. Many, many thanks to Kate and Linda and all of our expert panelists. And thanks too to everybody I see, including the mayors that are participating in our chat. I see a lot of good ideas and some strong opinions, and we want you to keep those coming. Now let's keep it moving and let's talk about city mobility. The idea of hyper-local planning is not exactly new, but it is picking up momentum, especially in European cities. To talk about the possibilities and the limits of the so-called 15-minute city, we're gonna to go to City Lab writer Fergus O'Sullivan, who'll be speaking with urban designer Dan Hill and award-winning placemaker Jay Pitter. But first, we'll make a brief sojourn to City Lab's European host city, and that's Helsinki, a city that is leading the world in building trust and engaging residents. City Lab, tervetuloa Helsinki. Helsinki is the capital of Finland, which has been ranked as the happiest nation in the world three years in a row. I think that the main reason why we have been able to manage the pandemic is our people trust each other, they trust authorities, they also follow the rules, restrictions and recommendations. A large public sector makes sure that all people get support and services equally. Even during the best times, it's amazing. <laughs> people do not have to be afraid of, of losing their jobs and they know that the society and the people are taking care of them and helping them in that kind of situation. We have a 
80,000 people of the age of 70 and, and more. And we created the Helsinki Help concept where we aim to call each and every one, asking them how they are feeling and then also delivering food or medicine if needed. And that was a huge effort we were able to put up in a quite short period of time. I actually believe that the COVID pandemic revealed more than it changed. A city which is based on trust, a city which is functional, is better prepared to any kind of crisis. The people of Helsinki are in tune of their identities. You can be as you are in Helsinki. That gives me hope. In a period when lockdowns have newly focused people on their immediate facilities, the 15-minute city concept has become a much discussed one in planning circles. A template adopted by the city of Paris in 2020, it aspires to provide urban citizens with the theoretical potential to access all of their daily needs, be it work, services, leisure, within a 15-minute radius of their homes, thereby reducing the obligation to travel and freeing up space previously reserved for paths for public areas, green spaces. That concept has been seized the imagination of the wider media, accompanied by very appealing renderings of green, pedestrian-friendly streets. But while its goals, its professed goals of more sustainable, future-proof cities are widely shared, is it a conceptual tool? Is it a spatial model that can truly profoundly grapple with the inequities, be they social or racial, that are hardwired into our cities and their planning? Could they potentially do little, little to shift those inequities or even serve to exacerbate them? Thanks so much for joining me, um, Jay and Dan. Much appreciated. Dan, I'd just like to start with you. Um, the 15-minute city certainly seems to have a lot of wind in its sails as a concept at the moment. What do you think it's offering that is so especially appealing right now? Uh, yeah, it's a good question because it certainly has captured attention, as you say, and not just in Paris, but all over the place. Um, so part of me thinks it's to do with almost a very old idea of cities. Um, you could argue that almost all cities were 15 minutes-ish until about 60, 70 years ago, when we really let the car off the leash and started to hack cities apart and let them sprawl and spread out in different ways there. So it became a question of 30 and 40 and 60 minutes, average commute times, things like that. So there's kind of something deep and underlying about that's the way that cities have been for most of the existence in a way, uh, certainly until the last couple of generations. But I think what's interesting about it is it really I think if you frame the question well, then it forces a, a concentration on the idea of the daily needs and desires of people. Um, that's the way it's sort of described. And people sometimes get this wrong. They think of these 15 minutes from a spatial point of view as if it's like a 15 minute prison with a person in the middle of it. And it's not really that. It's about saying, well, what are the relationships around you that you need to support a thriving life one way or another? And if you push it in that direction and then think about needs and desires, that seems quite potentially interesting that there's thousands of people there. Or each of them has their own 15 minute cities, hundreds of thousands of 15 minute cities overlapping each other. So I think that's really an interesting shift. It shifts planning away from these inert static structures like floor plates and district layouts into something which is far more about relationships, needs, desires, um, those kinds of things. And then I think finally, um, there's no doubt that the pandemic probably has reinforced a bit of this in the last year or so, rightly or wrongly, or unfortunately, whatever. Um, but, you know, we've, many of us have been now sitting in 15 minute cities for a year, um, unable to really kind of move in quite the same way we did before. So I'm not saying that's a good thing, clearly, but it's certainly sharpened the attention on your neighborhood and your neighbors and the people around you. So in some way, I think it it predates the pandemic, obviously, but it's certainly not being slowed down by it. If anything, that idea has been accelerated by it. I'd be, I'd be interested in seeing, I mean, you lay out very clearly why people are so engaged with this right now. What kind of limits do you think are there on what it can actually deliver of that promise? It's particularly what I'm thinking about social sustainability and equitable cities. There are huge limits to it if traditionally practiced. <laughs> so if it's seen as a sort of a top-down technocratic urban planning led movement, then 
clearly uh, that could, as your question suggests, exacerbate things, make things a lot worse, actually, as well as it could improve certain things. So it does nothing in a sense for giving people um, more livelihood. Uh, it does nothing necessarily for social justice. You know, so if it is really just a spatial reorganization of services in a way, um, that in the worst sense could lead to a series of gated communities with some very privileged situations. So for sure, absolutely. So I say, if, again, if traditionally practiced, deeply problematic. However, there's no need for it to be traditionally practiced. I think hopefully we're past the time where you sort of see the urban planning department as a silo separate to the economic development, separate to social services, separate to healthcare, separate to environment and so on. If you play it out properly, then it enables you to bring all of those things together in the street simultaneously, that's very powerful. You're then talking, as I said earlier, about relationships, about social relationships as the starting point for it. So it becomes the vehicle through which you can address questions of social justice or environmental justice. Absolutely. But that takes a complete reframing of um, the way you approach it. It can't be technocratic urban planning led. It's got to be something far more systematic and holistic. Jay, we talked a few days ago, and I understand that, well, at least you're unconvinced at how valid and useful this concept is as a motor for urban transformation. I'm a champion of uh, resilient and socially connected cities, of course. However, I am averse to this concept. It doesn't take into account um, histories of urban inequity uh, intentionally imposed by technocratic and colonial planning approaches, uh, such as uh, segregated neighborhoods, uh, deep amenity inequity and discriminatory uh, policing of our public uh, spaces. Um, furthermore, it doesn't uh, take into account the moment. It doesn't meet the moment. We're, we're looking at a model from Paris and you know, proposing that we impose that model on cities that have evolved in very different social and spatial patterns. You know, cities on the spoke, on a grid, and also uh, slums in the outer, from the outer core. We're talking about cities with uh, deep and complex uh, histories of social tensions um, right across North America, um, from segregation to tensions uh, between uh, colonialist and indigenous uh, populations, uh, tensions with uh, gender and how women experience uh, the public realm and navigate cities. We haven't acknowledged that cities have fundamentally been designed uh, for men. Um, they're actually coded as spaces that are male while the home has been coded as spaces for women um, and uh, gender diverse individuals. And so it doesn't explicitly acknowledge any of that. So while I really liked what Dan said, the truth is that without explicitly acknowledging these things, um, we're already down the path of a technocratic approach. Um, I'll give you a very uh, quick example as well in terms of why we need to consider uh, amenity inequity. Um, a article in the Toronto Star showed that within Canada, we only have 23% uh, of uh, neighborhoods would benefit or be able to transform into this 15 minute uh, city because only 23% of those uh, neighborhoods have the kinds of amenities to support this proposal. And so there's a lot of, uh, it's presumptive, um, it's not evidence-based, um, it has a cultural uh, bias, and the thinking is extraordinarily incomplete. What do you think the kind of widespread adoption of this as planning orthodoxy, what effect might that have on marginalized communities? What are your fears on that? Well, what we see already is that within marginalized communities, we see resistance of things that are actually really wonderful and beneficial, like so more walkability or bike lanes. And the reason we see this resistance is because these kinds of um, approaches to intensification, while good for us and good for the environment, they also often spur gentrification. And so communities are very nervous about that. 
Also, when we talk about living in very close proximity, one of the questions we haven't grappled with is that we've never done that in history. We've actually designed cities to create buffers between us across race and class specifically. This proposal completely ignores a century of planning interventions that have actually uh, concretized deep social divisions between people. So this proposal also lacks a social plan. And without a social plan, historically marginalized people become even more vulnerable. So what are we going to do about that? Dan, I, my, my question going on from that is that, um, I mean, are there ways of preventing, with, with there is resistance to, to things like bike lanes, for example, because they're seen as agents of gentrification and they're seen as not addressing the needs of people on lower incomes, people who are more marginalized in many urban communities. What is there a kind of uh, fix or an attitude or an approach that can be adopted to prevent this being such uh, top, being another top-down uh, approach to urban planning. Yeah, and uh, I fully agree with what Jay said. For what it's worth, I, mean, I always wanted to say what what she said. And um, and uh, it's funny when you were describing also a North American city, and you were talking about a spoke model with a kind of um, marginalized communities around the edge. You could apply the same criticism to Paris precisely. I almost felt you were talking about Paris at that point. So Paris has been subject to colonialist. Um, ethnic division as well with the Bon Louis, where uh, the colonial um, uh, forces play out most strongly in Paris. And so the the nice renders that you see, as you said, Fergus, they don't show a description of how that same model applies in the Bon Louis on the outskirts of Paris. So that's a, it's, a, it's absolutely right what Jay said. So I would say, I would flip it, as you know, the work we've been doing here in Sweden has been saying, well, kind of forget 15 minutes for now, let's start with one minute, which is the street. So we have a benefit of being able to kind of play it out actually at the super local level straight away. And what we've been leading here is this more one minute approach, which is how does the street redesign the street? You let them design the street, you give them the tools and you let, do you want bike lanes? Do you want barbecues? Do you want beehives? Do you want a bar? You know, it's kind of, those are elements that we can bring to bear, but it's up to the street itself to define and decide those things. Um, Dan was, Talk, discussing there the, the, the differences, the similarities and the differences between European and North American cities. What kind of what observations or what advice would you, what would you say to urban planners trying to um, introduce this model that's been developed in Europe outside in, into North America and other parts of the world? What would your advice or your caution to them be? So first I would advise not to continue um, importing European models and imposing them on North American cities because that is presumptive and colonial. Uh, secondly, though, I would build on what Dan said. I really like what he said about starting at the street level and working from there. I think that when we start from the street level and work from there, what happens is that we'll have more authentic intensification. So for some um, streets and cities, neighborhoods, it, they'll, they will go from a 45 minute a city to maybe a 20 minute city, and that may be significant progress. Some places will go from 60 minutes to 50 minutes, and that will be significant progress. And so we have to have a spectrum approach here. We also have to think incrementally, and we also have to take an approach that is very hyper-local. So what is interesting about this approach is it claims to be hyper-local, but it doesn't acknowledge the hyper-local context of different cities in different places. And so if we are really wanting um, to be hyper-local in our approach, which I think we all agree on, what that means is beginning by honoring, taking the time to learn and listen and get a really strong sense of the local context and going back to what Dan said, let's get right down to the uh, granular uh, street level shoulder to shoulder with folks in that neighborhood. Fantastic. Uh, Jay and Dan, thanks so much uh, for joining us. Much appreciated. And speaking of rethinking urban streets, now let's see how people are getting around in one of our host cities, Bogota. Cycling has made Bogota a smaller city, 
people who would otherwise not be able to arrive to the city centre to work can do it by bicycle safely. The past 15 years, I've been working a lot on advocacy for cycling. I started to see how the bicycle was actually something very good, for, not just for sports, and not just for me as a person, but as a mode of transport. Bogota was the very first to say we are going to do new bikeways for action against COVID. We now have more than 600 kilometers of bikeways in the city. As a consequence, 13% of trips are being done by bicycle. Bogota has become an inspiration to other places. I am incredibly excited about the future of cycling and the future of transportation. Improving conditions for everybody in a city to get to where they need to go safely, sustainably and equitably. Wow, that look at uh, Bogota makes me want to get on a real bike real soon. Love my Peloton, but I'd love to be out on the street. How is your city expanding transportation options for the pandemic and beyond? Tell us in the chat. In just a little bit, Mike Bloomberg is going to return with a special announcement. We'll also welcome Patty Harris, the CEO of Bloomberg Philanthropies, who will share her concluding reflections. But first, the assault on the U.S. Capitol and the law enforcement response Revive the national debate. Should America's capital city become its own state? Here to make the case for statehood for Washington, D.C. is none other than a one-time City Lab host, Washington, D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser. She'll be speaking with a former mayor from Philadelphia, Michael Nutter. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Nutter, former mayor of the city of Philadelphia, and I am so excited uh, to be here with my good friend, Mayor Muriel Bowser. Uh, Mayor, so excited to, uh, to be here with you this afternoon. We've seen you numerous times, uh, incredible leadership uh, uh, over the past few years, but certainly last year, 2020, uh, with uh, civil unrest, uh, the George Floyd protests, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement. Uh, I think I even saw you with a paintbrush uh, or, or uh, 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 painting, the, uh, painting the plaza. Mayors do it all. Uh, and you are out there uh, on the front lines. Um, so, uh, so how are you doing? How's it going? Uh, I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay, Mayor. And uh, you know well that we don't know always what will be thrown at us as mayors of major cities. Uh, and I just couldn't be prouder of my team, not only for the, the last six years of my tenure, but especially for the last year, as we have fought just an unprecedented uh, pandemic and um, what it's done uh, to the way we live. Well, Mayor, the, the thing that's uh, quite unique, and uh, I wanna have some conversation about it, um, unlike any other city, uh, in the United States of America. And, and certainly, you know, I brag on, of course, Philadelphia, birthplace of freedom, liberty, and democracy. But, you know, that changed uh, a number of years ago, uh, a lot of years ago. Uh, and uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, became the center of power uh, for the government of the United States of America. And so you have a particularly unique uh, position uh, as mayor of Washington, D.C. Many of the things that you're doing, many of the things that you talked about uh, would often be, in my situation, that would be a partnership uh, between uh, the city and the state. That's correct. Let's talk about Washington, D.C. Uh, being the 51st state of the United States of America. You, again, are providing that leadership uh, in that particular effort, but bring us up to date on what is really going on and, and even some near-term events. Sure, so uh, you, you've got it exactly right. We are completely unique in the American system. Not exactly a city, not exactly a state, a federal district, but not a territory. Uh, and so what that means is 700,000 people live here, uh, pay taxes, go to war, have all the responsibilities of American citizenship. In fact, we pay more taxes per capita uh, than any state, uh, but we don't have representation, voting representation in the Congress. Our Congresswoman doesn't have the vote and we do not have two senators. So that is uh, the, the predicament uh, of D.C. residents. The D.C. Statehood movement is not a new one. Uh, it's decades old, uh, but certainly right now, 
in my opinion, is our best opportunity for full American citizenship. Uh, next week, I'll testify uh, in the House uh, like I did last year on my Congresswoman's bill to make D.C. the 51st state. Uh, and the difference this year is uh, that we control the House and all House leadership supports D.C. statehood. In fact, it is mentioned in H.R. 1. Uh, we now control the Senate. Uh, Senate Majority Leader Schumer uh, has pledged his support for D.C. statehood. And Joe Biden is in the White House, who's been a long supporter of D.C. statehood. So the time is right. Uh, and more than that, D.C. residents are ready. A couple of years ago, we had a vote on statehood. More than 86 percent of the people um, voted in favor. We have a new constitution that outlines how our state will run. Uh, and we've outlined the boundaries of our new state. Uh, so where all the people live like me, 700,000 of us will become the 51st state. Uh, and where the Congress and the White White House and the Supreme Court, the National Mall are, will be the federal enclave or the federal district. You know, it's, uh, I'm not sure if many people think about it this way, but, you know, D.C. actually has more residents than at least two states uh, in the United States of America. Uh, uh, and, That's right. Um, you know, it's just, almost, it's, almost, you know, we have more than two uh, and nearly as much as two others. Um, so the argument that we're too small has been debunked. Argument that uh, the Constitution doesn't allow it has also been debunked. That we have, a, have to have a constitutional amendment to be uh, added to the union, also untrue. Every state outside of the first first 13 states uh, have been admitted to the union um, by a vote of the Congress. Uh, and that's what we are demanding as well. You know, uh, Mayor, um I seem to recall this from uh, from history. I think right at the start, uh, when uh, you know another group of people were you know seemingly in charge of uh, the thirteen colonies, as you mentioned, uh, there was uh, this feeling uh, that uh, you, taxation without representation is tyranny. Indeed, the people in Washington D.C. are experiencing now two hundred plus years later, still experiencing taxation without representation. Let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's a bedrock uh, of our nation's founding is that if you uh, consent to be governed and consent to pay taxes, that you have to have a, a voice uh, in that governance. Uh, and we simply lack that. Uh, and it is, it is a perversion of our democracy. And in fact, there's no uh, free democracy in the world where its capital citizens uh, don't uh, have a vote. Uh, so not only is it just fundamentally undemocratic. It, it just violates our principles of fairness and justice. Uh, and we think uh, that it, in fact, is one of the, um, the key ideas that have to be righted in our march towards more, uh, a more civil and just society. You made mention of, of course, the pandemic, which, again, we continue uh, to, uh, to live through you and your team uh, back in 2020 were some of the earliest uh, uh, efforts put forward to have a comprehensive plan uh, to help people uh, and citizens deal with uh, the uh, coronavirus. Uh, and again, you've been acknowledged uh, in your government uh, for uh, those efforts. But we also know uh, that uh, beyond the numbers, of course, there are real people uh, who have been affected. Uh, who have been uh, had uh, the disease uh, and even uh, passed away. And you've, again, provided that kind of leadership uh, for your citizens. At the same time, um, you know, mayors are still people. And we have our lives and we have our families. Uh, and, you know, we all know uh, that you've had uh, your own personal experience uh, in uh, this regard. Uh, certainly, you know, as a friend and, you know, we've already been in touch. But, you know, I just want to express my deepest condolences you, uh, to you. Uh, with regard to your uh, to your sister, and uh, and you. if there's anything that you want to share uh, uh, to uh, the broader audience about how people are dealing with this, but also again, you are a leader, and people look to you. Well, I appreciate that, Mayor, and my family has certainly been uh, touched by the the outpouring of support and kindness um, that we received. Um, and certainly as somebody who has been fighting this virus, leading an American city, trying to keep people alive, 
uh, it's been especially just hurtful for us that we lost our sister when we're so close um, to crushing this virus. Uh, so what I just want to remind everybody of uh, is it's not over. Uh, and we have to continue uh, to, to fight the virus, do all of the things that the public health officials tell us to do um, so that we can crush it uh, and get uh, back uh, to our lives. Uh, and we have to, we've seen how important government is. Uh, and the, the first it was testing and tracing uh, to keep people alive. Uh, now it's the vaccine rollout uh, to make sure that the vaccine is not only getting out, but is getting out to the people uh, who need it the most. Uh, it is making sure that we're supporting our small and local businesses who employ so many people so that we can come back. Um, and it, it just demonstrates that we're not, this is not over. Uh, and this virus has exposed so many inequities uh, already existing. Uh, and now we have to all focus on our recovery and how we recover more equitably. So when we come out on the other side of this thing, um, we're better, uh, we're stronger, and we're more equitable. Absolutely. Mayor, thank you so much for uh, that message and lifting up uh, the hearts uh, and, and the leadership of not just yourself and your own team, uh, but again, many of our participants uh, at the City Lab. Uh, there's one person that you and I know uh, very, very well who's also been a great leader uh, in so many, many areas, uh, whether as mayor, a philanthropist, and, and of course in the world of business, but also uh, he's been leading the fight uh, in the United States and around the world, uh, trying to uh, help all of us deal with uh, coronavirus. Uh, you know uh, that I'm talking about, of course, our good friend, uh, Mayor Mike Bloomberg. Uh, and yeah. uh, I wanna, at this point in time, thank you uh, for our thank opportunity you, uh, to, uh, to be together, uh, but also now turn things over to uh, Mayor Mike. You are very kind. Thank you, Mayor Nutter, for all your good work over the years. And from all of us at City Lab, I want to extend our gratitude and deepest sympathies to our friend, Maya Bowser, for her to join us at this difficult time and to share her family's story really means a lot. So thank you, Maya. As many of you may recall, Maya Bowser in Washington, D.C. served as City Lab's host back in 2019. We've been glad to support her at Bloomberg Philanthropies because she's doing big things on big issues. A year ago, when I was in Washington, I endorsed her push to become the 51st state. And hopefully, at a future city lab, she'll grace us with her presence as Governor Bowser. For now, mayors remain our best hope. Their innovative, bottom-up leadership is exactly what America urgently needs more of, right now. Today, Bloomberg Philanthropies is announcing a series of major new investments to help mayors and city leaders pursue big ideas and get big things done. First, we'll expand our city leadership initiative with Harvard, and we'll do it with a major new $150 million commitment from Bloomberg Philanthropies. We'll create a new center at Harvard dedicated to strengthening mayors and their teams, the first of its kind in the country. The center will include a new fellowship program for Harvard graduates who will go to work in cities nationwide helping mayors advance their high-priority projects, and will endow new professorships to support experts in tackling global challenges through local action. So that's the first big new investment. The second will be a $25 million partnership with New York University. Together, we'll create a new two-year leadership program that will train a diverse and talented group of students for careers in public service. This program will include scholarships for students in need so that everyone with the drive to serve in government can do so. And that's really important because strengthening city leadership means diversifying city leadership in every possible way. These two new investments build on Bloomberg Philanthropy's long-standing commitment to support mayors, whether it's by providing executive training or offering access to the best public health data or bringing public art to even more cities through our Asphalt Art Initiative. Now, before our city innovators get back to work, we've got one more special guest. 
I'm glad to say that both he and Mayor Bowser are distinguished alumni of, you guessed it, the Bloomberg Harvard City Leadership Initiative. His city of South Bend was also a winner of our foundation's Mayor's Challenge, a competition we run to spur urban innovation around the world. And Bloomberg Philanthropies has been very glad to collaborate with him over the years. Joining us now to discuss what the White House's Build Back Better strategy really means for cities, here is City Lab transportation reporter Laura Bliss speaking with the man formerly known as Mayor Pete, now Secretary Pete. And Secretary Buttigieg, it's great to be with you today. Thank you so much for your time. As the former mayor of South Bend, Indiana, you directed a budget of $358 million in a city of about 102000 Now you control an agency with a $90 billion budget with a staff of 55000 You've often touted the benefits of bringing local government experience to your leadership of USDOT, and you filled some of the highest impact positions at the agency with former city leaders from New York City to Portland to Minneapolis and beyond. Tell us about that. What makes local government experience such a key resume asset for you and for the rest of your department? Well, uh, as you said, I, I bring a mayor's eye view into the department. And I think having had that experience of being a city seeking federal support is going to be a really important one to tune the ways that this department works to be as helpful as possible to those on the ground. Uh, after all, so much of our transportation policy is not actually delivered here in Washington, uh, although it's certainly supported from, from Washington. It's, it's delivered uh, by the people who are doing the work day in, day out in the transit agencies, the state highway departments, uh, the, the, the mayors and, and the counties that are responsible for roads, uh, bridges, and on and on. What I want to do is make sure this is a department that is as responsive as possible, as, as, as user-friendly as possible, uh, and also can recognize the innovations that are taking place in our communities, in our cities, and help spread those and support those. Uh, you know, there's no question that this is a different role from uh, leading a city, but it's one where I think I'll be drawing on those experiences, certainly of my own city, and uh, also uh, coming from a city that isn't one of the largest in the country that didn't have a full-time staff just for the purpose of dealing with places like the Department of Transportation, uh, because I think it's often those communities that are sometimes left behind in the conversations here in Washington. I'm interested if you, in whether you think there's a role for DOT in areas that have been considered primarily local in scope. Um, I'm thinking about land use and city planning, which has long been considered key factor uh, in reducing reliance on cars, which is something that you've talked a lot about. Is, is that an area that DOT could, could increasingly enter into with this sort of city-centric perspective? I think the, the power in the decision-making really does belong at the local level on things like that. But we, what we can do federally is provide resources. Uh, uh, sometimes even just a little bit of moral support can go a long way. You know, when we were undertaking some of our infrastructure conversions in South Bend when I was mayor, you know, the idea that you would do anything to a road other than widen it, let alone actually slow things down a bit, which is what we did to some of our most important thoroughfares in order to turn them into more complete streets. You know, that was something that took a lot of pushing locally. And at the time, we, we had a supportive Secretary of Transportation in Anthony Fox, whose administration really, you know, provided a, a lot of messaging on why these kinds of steps around the country and communities large and small could be beneficial. So having benefited from that during my time as mayor, I'm very mindful of uh, some of the things that we can be doing, in addition to what might be the most important of all, which is those hard dollars, the actual resources that if, if we get this moment right, uh, we could have a once in a generation delivery of infrastructure support that can be used by states, by, by cities, by counties, by tribes and territories. Uh, of course, uh, this is not the first time that a new administration has raised expectations and hopes around infrastructure. So we've got to make sure that this time we actually get to deliver. But I really believe because of the urgency of the moment and frankly, the impatience of the public, that with uh, uh, some support and, and prodding uh, of Washington by local leaders like some of the folks we're gathered with today, we re really can get it done this time. What are the specific projects that you would like to see done as a priority as, as you work out your agenda for the coming years? 
Well, it's tempting to point to some of the most dynamic and exciting new things that are over the horizon, like high-speed rail, uh, the electrification of vehicles. And those are certainly very important. But I want to emphasize that actually a lot of what we've got to do is dealing with a maintenance backlog. Uh, fix it first, I think, is going to be a very important mantra for us. It doesn't always have the same sizzle as adding something new, but the, the truth is we've got to be doing both because you look at the conditions of, uh, of so many of our roads and, and bridges as a country, and it, it's just clear that we can't allow that backlog to continue. I remember doing the mental math in South Bend uh, when I realized that you know the, the most beautiful, newly paved piece of street lasted about 12 years in our climate with, with our snow and everything that that did to, to beat up the roads. And asking around for a little bit of napkin math, you know, given the dollars that we have, how long would it take us to repave every lane mile of street in the city? And the answer came back, about 100 years, uh, which uh, just doesn't compute if you can't get a, a surfacing project to last more than 10. So the implications of that are partly we just plain need more resources, but also we should be better managing what we already have. There are some places where we may need to add assets like roadways or uh, other transit resources. There's some areas where actually the, the number of square feet of asphalt in a city probably ought to go down. And we ought to be supporting that kind of right sizing as well if a local community sees that, that that's beneficial for the long term. I saw Senator Chuck Schumer talking recently about a new subway expansion into East Brooklyn, and there was some pushback about how much maintenance need there is on the New York City subway. So it sounds like you might kind of fall on the latter side of that uh, policy debate. It's a balance. Look, if, if there's a need, uh, we should meet it. And I'm a big believer uh, when appropriate, especially when it comes to transit, but also uh, passenger rail of adding resources that could make a difference. But yes, we've also got to think about the total cost of ownership of the things we're building and the things that, that we have that Washington hasn't been willing to support. I mean, especially when you consider uh, the situation for passenger rail, where unlike the highways, where there's a highway trust fund with dedicated resources and a predictable funding stream, same as there is for our airports, there isn't such a thing as of today for railways, which I think is one of the reasons why Americans are being asked to settle for less when it comes to passenger rail. I also think we ought to manage what we have and just be smart about it. Now, that's also something that should be a consideration in what we're putting onto the road. For example, one of the many benefits of electric vehicles, in addition to the fact that, uh, of course, they, they hold a lot of promise from a climate perspective, is that they often have fewer moving parts and require less in terms of the total cost of ownership and maintenance. Something else to consider is we're supporting not just uh, policies that will help individuals get into electric cars, but things like the grant programs that are helping communities purchase low or zero emissions buses. That in turn also supports environmental justice uh, goals since so often our biggest and, and busiest highways go through black and brown communities that are known to have higher rates of asthma. And then you have a public health equity issue if uh, high emitting buses continue to go through them. My point is that all of these things are integrated. The financial side, considerations of equity, considerations of climate, uh, and of course, the foundational mission for this department, which is safety. I, I'm glad that you actually went into the, some of the specifics on that. I, I'm curious, are there other particular projects or even particular cities um, that have been leading examples of the kinds of uh, you know, racial justice, uh, climate change centric policy objectives that you're increasingly baking into the DOT's uh, role making and, and policy making work? Well, we're definitely listening to the communities that have been the most intentional uh, about the equity and climate implications of their choices. And that's happening in so many different ways. In some of our biggest cities, you're seeing that uh, there's been a lot of mayoral leadership uh, that's part of helping convince the public to invest more in infrastructure. You look at uh, ballot measures and initiatives that have been passed in uh, Los Angeles under Mayor Garcetti or Austin under Mayor Adler, for example. But it's not just the biggest uh, cities with a lot of resources that we should be learning from. Uh, I just had a really compelling conversation with the mayor of Mount Vernon, New York, smaller, uh, lower income community, uh, where she's pointed out that because of the way uh, that that community is uh, often cut up by, by highways and other uh, kind of big pieces of infrastructure, uh, it can actually be easier for a resident there to get to Manhattan than it is to get within the city limits to where the grocery store is. That's why listening is such an important part of federal policy when it comes to how we engage with, with cities, counties, and towns. I had one last question for you, if you don't mind, uh, Secretary Buttigieg, and, and that's on the question of um, 
topic of technology, rather. It's something that you've talked a lot about and, and, the, and the sort of focus on innovation that you brought to your time in South Bend. Um, from my perspective, reporting on cities, I think that local governments have often struggled with sort of balancing the real world policy objectives with the flashy promise of new technology when it comes to transportation in particular, whether it's self-driving cars uh, or smart streetlights, vehicle tracking systems. And I'm wondering what you think the DOT's role is when it comes to helping local governments, state governments uh, kind of strike that balance between policy and the allure of the new. Yeah, so I, I think for geeks like us, the technologies are always going to be fascinating and attractive. And that's certainly true whether we're talking about, we're talking about the surface side, where you got things from electric vehicles to automated vehicles uh, dramatically transforming, uh, perhaps, the, the future of cars, to aviation, where uh, things very close to the ground like drones and commercial space are, are all growing at the same time. Uh, and, and of course, the opportunities around rail and, and some of the other things we've talked about. Uh, and I'm always interested in, in more ideas around that. In fact, it was here at City Lab that I learned a lot about uh, uh, digital citizenship efforts that were being pursued uh, in, in countries around the world that I think we could learn a lot from too. The important thing, I believe, in terms of not getting carried away or keeping our focus is to remember it's never technology for its own sake. When we're contemplating paying a lot of attention or making a big investment in technology, the question has to be, what problem does this solve? And as we take equity more seriously as a transportation priority, I think it's just as important to ask the question, whose problems will this solve? And if we get that right, then anything we do around technology will be focused on the policy and mission priorities that are why we're here in the first place. Thank you so much for your time, Secretary Buttigieg. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Same here. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Laura. And wow, what a fantastic conversation. It was great to hear from Secretary Buttigieg. We've been big fans of his going back to when he was Mayor Pete. He was part of the very first class of mayors in our Bloomberg Harvard City Leadership Initiative. And he was an amazing participant. In addition, his team went on to win our 2018 Mayor's Challenge. So I can't think of a better person to wrap up our main stage programming. This year's City Lab was unlike any other, but our goal was the same, to hear and learn about the very best in city innovation. And it's fair to say we accomplished that, and then some. You heard from some of the top minds and thinkers in medicine and public health, cybersecurity, climate change, social and racial justice, the arts, education, and on and on. We hope to bring you all together in person next year. But what's amazing about the past eight years of City Lab is that whether we've been in London or Los Angeles or Washington's or online, the quality of the programming and the spirit of the event has remained the same. And the fact that we were able to attract such an incredible group of speakers and participants this year is a testament to the power of this event and technology and the power that cities hold as a proving ground for innovation. On behalf of Bloomberg Philanthropies, I want to thank our longtime City Lab partner, the Aspen Institute. My great friend Dan Porterfield and the entire Aspen team are incredible and such a joy to work with, and we treasure our partnership. Next, our four virtual host cities really made this year special. San Francisco, Bogota, Helsinki, and Freetown. And I want to thank their terrific mayors for their inspiring leadership. Their beautiful, dynamic cities have been on full display these past two days. And I don't know about you, but I cannot wait to visit them as soon as it's safe to do so. I also want to thank our City Lab host, the great Errol Lewis, and all our fantastic speakers who took time out of their very busy schedules to be here. Mayor Muriel Bowser, Vice President Kamala Harris, and of course, Dr. David Kessler, who might be the busiest man in America right now. Finally, thank you to my amazing colleagues at Bloomberg Philanthropies, including Jim Anderson and Lauren Rudifer, for their leadership in bringing this incredible event together. With that, this concludes our main stage programming, but I hope that you'll be joining our breakout sessions tomorrow and that you'll take what you've learned this week and put it into action. As Mike said, now is the time for cities to lead 
and at Bloomberg Philanthropies, we're doubling down on our commitment to support you. We'll be with you every step of the way. On behalf of everyone at CityLab, thank you and stay safe.